Coming up, Mary Catherine Nagel, an attorney and playwright, how Cherokee history inspires both of her careers. So I think no matter what you do, whether it's write plays or fight cases in the court, I think that we all feel, even if it's just subconscious, a little bit of that pressure of, I'm here today, I've got to do something with that. And the accomplished artist Daniel Horsechief, the life events that led him to create some of the most well-known sculptures in the Cherokee Nation. I think each piece, I think in terms of legacy. And the only thing really I want my work to be is sincere. I want it, I think if it's sincere, all that will come out. All right, paddlers, sit ready. Plus, paddling Oregon's Willamette River with Cherokee Nation citizen Joellen Marshall and... This ball's gonna be around to the right and he will try to jerk it down. Getting back in the arena with professional bull rider Ryan Dirt Eater. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing succeeding and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to ride. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. Wado. Osio, it's how we say hello in Cherokee, and welcome to the Cherokee National Prison Museum in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. This is just one of many historic sites here in the Cherokee Nation. First up today, attorney and playwright Mary Catherine Nagel. The descendant of a controversial figure in Cherokee history, Mary is inspired by the stories of our tribe's past and uses that knowledge to fight legal battles for the future of Native America. A lot of people think that lawyers are people who read and write well, and they should be, but good lawyers know how to tell stories. Successful lawyers tell stories well. A lot of my fellow law students in law school were very good storytellers. Many of them had been involved in theater at some point in their life, and one of my favorite memories of law school was every year I was in law school, we produced a play. What first captured me was escaping fully into someone else's story. Uh, was really intriguing to me and, and all of a sudden being somewhere else and um, creating a whole other world with other people. When I graduated from law school, I actually ended up clerking for two federal judges at once in the District of Nebraska and Omaha, Judge Joseph Battalion and Judge Lori Smith Camp. And one of the first assignments that Judge Battalion gave me, he came into my office and said, Mary Catherine, I want you to uh, research all the decisions that this federal court has issued and pick the most important one. And we're gonna create a historical display on the first floor of the courthouse. And I discovered that in 1879, the first federal judge in the district of Nebraska declared Indians to be persons under the law. And that was the trial of Chief Standing Bear. And I had never heard of this case before. So I go to my judge and I said, Judge, I've picked a case, you know, Standing Bear versus Crook. And I said, this May 12th, 2009 is the 130th anniversary of the trial. We should, on the 130th anniversary, invite the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska and their chairman and their leadership to come for a ceremony in the courthouse and we should do a reenactment of the trial. And he's like, a reenactment? Like, like a play? You know, there's certain things we can do as lawyers. You know, you can argue cases, you can write law review articles, you can write really good briefs and you can cite all the cases, but what's missing in the United States right now are our stories. I am a direct descendant of John Rich and Major Rich, and actually that's one of the plays that I'm writing right now for the arena stage is about the Ridges and John Ross. Most folks at Cherokee Nation know them as the signers of the Treaty of New Echota. Some would say they deserve to be assassinated, and 
I understand that. I understand where those feelings come from. I would ask that people learn the entire history. There, was a, there were a lot of things that happened before 1835. So I write this play and um, I was kind of, I was very nervous writing it at first. But then I thought, you know what? This is what I do though. I gotta write this and this is who I am. So I wrote this play and we were doing a reading of it. It was so powerful to have them in the room reading um, Major Ridge and then a, a Ridge descendant. They both said to me afterwards, I just was taught as a kid that the Ridges were bad people and that they're the reason the Trail of Tears happened. And now I understand the full story. And I really think that, you know, I can think that the treaty was wrong, but I understand that both the Ridges and the Rosses were just doing what they thought would save their nation. And that to me was so incredibly meaningful. You know, a lot of people talk about historical trauma and the trauma um, that gets passed down from generation to generation. And I didn't really think about it, but um, Dr. Dwayne King, who's at the Gilcrease, who's done a ton of research on Cherokee Nation history, I was reaching out to him and I was, I was going through the John Ross papers at the Gilcrease and he said, you know, I actually know the very spot where Major Ridge was shot. Do you want to see it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to I go. And I didn't really think about it and, until I got there and, and until I, I stood on the spot. And I can't explain it, it just, um, it made it very real in a way that I had never, you know, I'd always intellectualized it. And then all of a sudden I'm trying to write their words. And, um, and I'm, I'm hearing my grandmother who's no longer with me. And um, I mean, it just, it, it was intense in a way that has never, I, I've never experienced before. And it does feel like I have to get this right. It has to be perfect. And every line has to be perfect. Otherwise I've failed them. And, um, that's a, a tough burden to carry. But I think that that's, I'm not unique in that. Anyone who's a citizen of a tribal nation is here today because at some point along the way, someone in their lineage, right, um, sacrificed his or her life so that they could be here today. And so I think no matter what you do, whether it's write plays or fight cases in the court or you know, practice traditional art or make food or raise families, whatever you're doing, right, it's, I, I think that we all feel, even if it's just subconscious, a little bit of that pressure of, I'm here today, I've got to do something with that. Daniel Horsechief is a well-known sculptor and painter here in the Cherokee Nation. His mother is a well-known art teacher, so Daniel's grown up around art his entire life. But it wasn't until an accident that he was truly inspired to do the work he's known for today. Everything is art to me. And that's where our culture is, you know? And that comes from just being a part of who created us. I mean, we're constantly doing that ourselves, whether it's with ideas or visuals. I'm Daniel, Horse Chief. I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma. I live in Salisaw now, and I live in Cherokee country, and I've grown up here my whole life. I was a really quiet kid when I was growing up. I was the last, the youngest of the four children. In school, that was kind of my world, it was my notepad, and that was the way I communicated with other people. I really started painting, actually, in high school, and I was just, I was mesmerized by it because I, I was always interested in learning and reading you know, different cultures and periods. And, uh, you know, it, it really, it, it seemed like it, it complemented everything art did. I started out actually with black and white and with pencil, and that really helped me to develop my painting. And as a summer job, I painted toy soldiers for a living, and that helped me to mix paint colors. And so when I switched to oil painting, I already knew how to mix the colors and how to uh, use the brush and that sort of thing. So you never know what you get into, how it's gonna you know, affect the other. I was pretty lost, I think, after high school. I started developing problems with depression and that sort of thing when I was in junior high and when I look back at it. I kind of self-medicated, they say. And so the biggest turning point was an accident I had. A, it was on a balcony high up and I fell off the balcony and I crushed my, pretty much my body the impact was on this arm, you know, and they, they're gonna cut it off at, 
they decide to save it. And they, it's a miracle I could use my hand. And so I was pretty helpless for about two years. And my mother took me in and she took care of me every day. I was helpless. I was, I could only lay down. She just gave me encouragement, you know. I couldn't even sleep at night because of the pain. And I think I went through that pain for a reason. That's really sparked uh, my creativity, I think. What I did was, from the time of the toy soldier painting gig, I actually sculpted small things for this person. And the only thing I did was just scale it up. I was just hooked. You know, I realized everything I was studying, the painting, the reading, everything I was doing, my love for people's pottery and basketry, all that kind of went into sculpting. Now I try to keep things simple. I used to over plan, overdo. I find you could, you could work a week on a plan and when it comes time to fulfill it, it all goes out the window, you know? So actually just getting in there and doing it, you know, it, it ends up being a real simple process. We have Sequoia at NSU and that's within Cherokee Nation. And that was my first commission finished piece. And as I was working on that, I was working on uh, the stickball players, the four piece stickball players that it's at Sequoia High School in Tahlequah. I did a three foot Sequoia for Sequoia High School in California recently. And Cherokee Nation acquired, I think four of those for the different clinics. The veteran statue, that took three years, and we just installed that a few months ago at the Veteran Center. To me, that's my life's work. And Cherokee people in general, and Native people, about respecting our veterans and people who have sacrificed, and so I put everything into that one. You know, when I got injured, you know, I couldn't sleep at night if I did, and I took cat naps throughout the day. But there's something about the night, you know, when you open that door at four o'clock and you step outside and there's nothing going on and you can see all the stars. It's that solitude, that rest, that kind of, to me, it's comforting. But usually it's a pretty lonely endeavor. You know, you, you just go at it for hours and hours and you're so wrapped up into it. You know, as an artist, that's kind of when you're going from day to day worrying about your next gig or whatever, it, it's kind of hard to even think about. But at the same time, yeah, I, I think each piece, I think in terms of legacy. And the only thing really I want my work is to be is sincere. I want it, and I think if it's sincere, all that will come out. You know? I'm really fortunate to be a part of Cherokee Nation, to have so many good people around me, neighbors and family. I, I just feel indebted to my people now because uh, you know, they pulled me out of this. And everything I do now, I wanted to touch my people. And I think art works really good at that, you know, that visual impact. And I wanted to draw people to us. And I wanted to draw us to other people because we have so much commonality. We're from the same creator. And that's what I want my art to do. Let's use it in a good way. By the mid-1860s, the Texas cattle ranching industry was booming. In the 20 years following the American Civil War, nearly six million head of cattle were driven out of Texas to markets in the Midwest. Most of the cattle trails led through Indian Territory and the six million acres of land known as the Cherokee Outlet. Cowhands would stop and allow their herds to graze in the outlet for weeks or even months before continuing on the trail. The outlet belonged to the Cherokees, but the U.S. government forbid the tribe from permanently settling there. The Cherokee Nation recognized the opportunity to play a huge role in the growing cattle industry. So in 1879, they sent representatives to the outlet to collect grazing taxes from all men who were pasturing herds there. Over the next five years, the treasurer of the Cherokee Nation, D.W. Leip, collected more than $80,000 in grazing taxes at his office in Caldwell, Kansas. 
The cattlemen of the area decided to organize and in March 1883 formed the Cherokee Strip Livestock Association. Later that year, the Cherokee National Council leased the entire outlet to the Cherokee Strip Livestock Association for a term of five years at $100,000 per year. The association became the most influential livestock association in the world, and in 1888, it secured an additional five-year lease from the Cherokee Nation for the amount of $200,000 per year. However, following the land run of 1889, the public and the U.S. government began to demand that the Cherokee outlet be opened for white settlement. U.S. President Benjamin Harrison issued a proclamation forbidding all grazing on the lands of the outlet and ordering all cattle to be removed by October 1, 1890. The Cherokee Strip Livestock Association offered to buy the outlet from the Cherokees for $3 an acre, but the federal government instead forced the Cherokee Nation to sell it for less than half that, at $1.40 an acre. The Cherokee outlet was open to settlement in the land rush of September 1893. We first introduced you to professional bull rider Ryan Dirt Eater back in 2015. Well, a lot has happened with Ryan's career in that short time, so we thought we'd check back in with him and see how he's doing. This bull's going to be around to the right, and he will try to jerk you down. To be a world champion, you have to uh, be the best all season long, and that's something I failed to do the, you know, the previous years I've been riding professionally. Last season uh, was great. I won uh, three Built for Tough events and uh, went to the World Finals and I was 2016 PBR World Champion and that was, that was huge in my career. Confidence is huge in this uh, sport because uh, you're climbing on you know, animals. It's a battle every time you nod your head. You, know, you got to love to do it. I mean, it's, it's a sport that's it's crazy. You know, I always knew I can be a world champion, but now I know I can be a world champ if I uh, just give it everything I got. I turned around, looked at my dad, I said, Dad, it's my time here. Stuck my hand in my bull rope, slid up, nodded my hand, and it was just like magic happened. Right, he will try to jerk you down. my most prestigious award. Um, I knew what I had to do and uh, he couldn't butt me off. You know, I, I rode him perfect. What, what an exciting world finals. This season, I'm gonna give it everything I got. Let's talk Cherokee. Where do you go to school? Hotla de Hadeslo Quai. Hotla. Hotla. De Hadeslo Quai. De Hadela Quai. I go to the Cherokee Immersion School. Jalagi Juna Deslo Quasti. De Cadelo Quai. Jalagi. Jalagi. Juna Deslo Quasti. Juna Dela Quasti. De Cadelo Quai. De Cadelo Quai. Where do you work? Hotla de Jalawistane ha. Hotla. Hotla. De Jalawistane ha. De Jalawistane ha. I work for Cherokee Nation. Jalaki. A yearly. Dagilawistane ho e. Jalaki. A yearly. Jalaki. A yearly. Dagilawistane ho e. Dagilawistane ho e. The Cherokee Nation, members of the community, and several state and federal dignitaries celebrated the groundbreaking of a major expansion to the W.W. Hastings Hospital here in Tahlequah. The new 469,000 square foot health facility is the result of the largest joint venture agreement ever between a tribe and the federal government. 
Upon completion, the outpatient facility will be the largest Indian Health Service funded facility in the country, offering expanded services. The new facility will nearly triple the space for outpatient services currently housed at Hastings Hospital. It's going to bring in specialists, it's going to bring in uh, clinics that we, we don't offer now. Uh, I, you know, I truly believe it's going to change the lives of the Cherokee people. Construction of the four-story facility is expected to be complete in 2019. The future of the Cherokee language took a major step forward with the graduation of the first set of Cherokee language apprentices. Cody Van and Don Duggar are the first two citizens to complete the course after 4,000 hours of studying the Cherokee language. The Cherokee Nation started the program two years ago to teach more young adults to be conversationally proficient Cherokee speakers and teachers. Program officials expect to graduate four more students from the language program next year and eight students in 2018. Cherokee Nation marshals showed just how tough they are by taking the plunge into icy cold water to raise money for a good cause. The marshals are diving in to raise money and awareness for the athletes of Special Olympics Oklahoma. Each year, the marshals raise thousands of dollars in donations to offset the cost of room and board and equipment for local Special Olympic athletes to attend the summer games in Stillwater in May. Anytime that we can get together and gather funds for a greater, a greater cause is, is outstanding. To learn more Cherokee Nation news, go to anadisco.com or click on our website, oco.tv, and look for links mentioned. There are more than 300,000 Cherokee Nation citizens living in Oklahoma and around the world. Today, we want to introduce you to a citizen living in Portland, Oregon. She may be thousands of miles away from Oklahoma, but that doesn't stop Joellen Marshall from being involved with her tribe. My name is Joellen Marshall. I'm retired and I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, these are my parents, Joe and Maureen, when they got married. My mom had studied statistics in college and my dad was a PR man and he got a job in Tulsa with PSO and we moved there when I was a year old. Um, that's at the Tulsa Zoo, which is notable because I ended up <clears throat> working in three different zoos. I kind of fell into this job through the University of Oklahoma working with chimpanzees uh, and thought it would be a temporary thing, but then when I moved to California, it was teaching or working with animals, and I kind of went the animal route instead. So I worked in three zoos that start with O's, um, Oakland, Oklahoma City, and Oregon. At the Oregon Zoo, and I got to raise three wolves. That was pretty cool. The last two I worked pretty much exclusively with marine life. So this is on the Illinois many years ago. This is kayaking in Canada on a, with a group of women. This is here in Oregon on the Deschutes River. It's very important for me to stay connected to the Cherokee Nation, and I'm able to do that through our satellite organization. I'm part of a group here, Mount Hood Cherokees. We're a satellite group of the Cherokee Nation. For those of us that don't live within the 14-county jurisdictional area, uh, satellite communities have sprung up in the last five years, and they give people a chance to meet other Cherokees where they live and build some community. For a number of people in our community, they have Cherokee roots, but they haven't really been able to explore a whole lot of what that means. So it's nice to come together um, away from the nation and try to build on that community. Uh, there's certainly a sense of pride that comes with being Cherokee and learning more about our culture and where we came from and what our ancestors went through. Um, there's an over abiding sense of resilience I get from 
knowing what my ancestors dealt with and what they did to survive. And I really appreciate learning more about that. The Golden Dragons is a senior paddling club in Portland here, and I joined it after I left work. It's a paddling club for members that are 50 and over. One, two, three. We load the boats a little before nine, and we go out regardless of the weather. It is an all-volunteer club, and we have people that agree to learn how to be collars or tillers. All right, paddlers, get ready. The collar stands in the front of the boat and faces the 20 paddlers and calls the strokes. Five, four, three. And the tiller pretty much is the steers person. They have a long till that's in the water, and they guide the boat. It's a great way to get exercise and have community, but also a little bit of quiet time, even though you're surrounded by 20 other people. It's really a time to reflect and just be thankful and be glad to be alive on the river. Well, go Golden Dragons. That's how we say thank you in Cherokee. Next time on OCO Voices of the Cherokee People. Cherokee National Treasure Richard Fields teaches us how to make a bow. What's really the best part about it is you take it out there and shoot it. You know, it, it's, it, it feels good to shoot your own bow and what you made. Join us for that story and much more on the next OCO Voices of the Cherokee People. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, donadago ha'i. We'll see each other again. So until next time, wado. OCO, I'm Sina Hayes, and I'm a senior at Sequoia High School. Last year, I tore the ACL on my knee and had to sit the basketball season out. Luckily, I have Sooner Care coverage in addition to health care at the Cherokee Nation Health Facilities. Sooner Care picked up the extra cost for specialty visits so that I could get back on the court. Ask your patient benefit coordinator at any Cherokee Nation Health Facility to sign up or call 1-844-749-GAME. We want you to get in the game, get covered.